After awakening from a dream in the late 1800s, Robert Louis Stevenson crafted the novel The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. During that same period, Sigmund Freud was dabbling in psychoanalysis and developing his own theories of the id, superego, and ego, a theorem that was to forever change our understanding of the human mind. Endless dalliances in cinema have made this story iconoclastic, to say the least, but not until Leslie Brickus's book and lyrics and Frank Wildhorn's music has the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde reached an immediacy which may call our own persona into question. Lucy is able to look into the eyes of someone and know them. She's probably one of the great all-knowing characters in the show, isn't she? I love that you pick that up. That's something that I've really worked on in the show, the real connection between Bob and I, Bob who plays Jekyll Hyde. Young girls should not be out gallivanting with fellas. Young girls? I'm 40 years old for fix it. Finish it. I don't know if anybody's touched on this or not. But I have tremendous sympathy for your character because you have endured an awful lot of abuse, maybe physical, maybe not, from the daughter. And you have put up with her, and she doesn't survive without you. She's not able to stand on her own two I feet. I totally love you. You're the first person who has ever said that to me. Everyone sees what's happened to Maureen. Hi, I'm Mike Baker. This is National Arts, and we are on Broadway. The first original American play on Broadway in the 1999 season was Warren Light's gripping new play, Sideman. With Christian Slater as the play's narrator and conscience, Sideman tells the story of one man's obsession with jazz, a horn player named Gene, and the hilarious and devastating effects it has on his wife Terry, son Clifford, and his friends. The play also recounts the rise and fall of the big band movement and imparts a bit of jazz history along the way. You know who you sound like? You sound like this. Don't ever say that. There is guys. something that you do that he does. Only an octave and a half lower. Early on, we see a lot of humor. Then we see humor mixed with heartbreak. Then we see considerable heartbreak. But then we see some form of resolution. Uh, is that the pattern you were looking for? Yeah, and I'm, you're very good. <laughs> no, I mean, I appreciate it, because I'm, I'm used to going for jokes, and that's the kind of writing I'd mostly done, and I had avoided writing this story. I know where we want to get back to is to tell the story through the dance, and I think you've done that beautifully. The, the, the choreography gets more physical. You really do know, I'm telling you. I, I don't know interviewers <laughs> like you, and that's the truth. And there's a, even an occasional goose step, which sort of kind of harkens to that encroaching Nazism. In the, at the top of the second act, very, is, you're very right. As Buck, you have this wonderful line about how she writes that she immerses herself in the work, and then having finished, she awakens to the real world. That's the way the playwright has fashioned this piece, and that's the way you portray it. Right. You immerse yourself in these various Eastern and Western characters, and then you awake to the audience. That's correct. It's, oh my gosh, how wonderful. That's, that's it. She talks about them living in your head. Speaking of that, do you think that somehow the, the characters that we play, that we, that we gain anything from that, at least psychologically, or is it just subconscious wash? For me, uh, when, I was, when I was doing very bad things, it came at such a, a, a perfect time, you know, and, and to play a character that is, was so uh, energetic and so passionate and, and uh, you know, could just let all that stuff out, well, it was sort of, it was, it was you know, it was another one of those things that was kind of like it was put in my life at the exact right time for me to do, so I'm grateful for that. For decades, Gene blew life into the trumpet, but slowly it siphoned his air and became a stranglehold on his existence. How ironic that something so sinewy, lyric, and ever-changing ceased to be a passion suited for heaven's framing. I hope you enjoyed our discussion with gifted playwright Warren Light 
and his autobiographical counterpart, Christian Slater. See you next time on National Arts on Broadway. He even commented in the play that uh, he felt that once having gotten to age 40 that nothing significant could come after. I think maybe one of the reasons why he hastened to write The Common Law five days before he turned 40 years old. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he felt his life, his, his judicial life, was, or legal life was over. It, it is still, I think, one of the most seminal works in the law is his common law. The whole concept of free speech, which we see in the play, yeah. and the maintenance thereof, as well as the, the notion that the law evolves as civilization evolves. It's a, it's a living instrument, much like the Constitution. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, well put. Yeah. That's exactly what he believed, and it's proving, hopefully, to be true. You know, we've seen so many changes down through the few years you know, since Holmes left. This Rosica Schwimmer opinion, that's a big fight. Oh yes, it's not just a question of denying to a sincere woman pacifist. Welcome to National Arts, I'm Mike Baker. Jerry Lewis began his performance career at the age of five on the Borscht circuit in New York and never looked back. What followed was a successful mime act, collaboration with Dean Martin, and a lucrative stint as a producer, director, actor, and recording artist. With over 60 films to his credit and accolades worldwide for his work on behalf of neuromuscular diseases, Lewis has set his sights on yet another goal, his Broadway debut as Applegate in Damn Yankees. Whenever I'm, from time to time, depressed. And a trauma wells and swells within my breast. I find some time deep inside. There was uh, Watergate, then there was Iran Gate. And if you take Damn Yankees as the Garden of Eden Revisited, then the name you've been dubbed Applegate is indeed meritorious. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm one of the happier gates. Mm -hmm. An incredible, incredible role in an, in, an, in an absolutely impeccable, impeccable show. You know, I couldn't help but think in, in seeing the show that uh, the Jelly Roll Morton's adventurous style on the piano is very symbolic of his life in a way. A very you know, no character. one's ever said that. Yes, it's very true. It's very true. Once you get really into the music, and since he was and is considered an innovator, he was sort of like exploring new ground as a person, too. And I think, at least in George Wolfe's vision, who was the writer director. also credited with really making the transition from ragtime to jazz and being a, attributed really with the, the influential person that did that. And he, he kind of took Joplin and he swung in a way. And with the syncopation, I couldn't help but liken that in his music to tap and what you do well, in I terms think, of syncopation. Yeah, because tap is basically rhythm yeah. and, uh, and time. I did a character, as a matter of fact, uh, up in Toronto. I did a movie called Giant Steps, a movie that nobody will ever see. Mm -hmm. It's one of my best roles. <laughs> one of the best roles I've ever mm -hmm. done. But it was about a jazz musician, and I, I kind of patterned the, uh, the character after a, a Thelonious Monk. There's a tonal color that seems to be a common thread throughout your pieces. Blues, some new blues, really. Some new blacks, some new grays, some new tones altogether, to unique work, really. to your work. I mean, was that conscious, or did that just evolve as you began to paint? Well, it's it's evolution, and uh, all of it is conscious. I mean, I, I'm very much aware of uh, technique because I have a fairly uh, extensive background in in the arts. You know, my whole life has been an, an aesthetic life, but I've always been very much impressed with the what they call the chiaroscuro school of painting. We hope you enjoyed seeing this other side of Billy D. Williams. Both on and off the screen, he certainly is an inspiration to all. And now, let's take a look at what was the first electronic jazz classroom. This special concert featuring an all-star band was beamed live via satellite to classrooms all across the country. It offered students an opportunity to hear performance and discussion from some of the jazz mainstays like Clark Terry, Joshua Redmond, Terry Lee Carrington, and composer, keyboardist, and record producer Herbie Hancock.
an opportunity to talk to Steve Lacey, who, as you know, is father of the soprano sax and makes his living overseas. He says that jazz really doesn't get the kind of musical notoriety that it should in this country. Do you think this kind of electronic classroom will kind of help build audiences for the future and guarantee its survival? Well, I'm hoping that that will be one of the uh, benefits of doing this kind of electronic classroom. You know, I know Steve Lacey, and uh, he's been living in, in Europe for, for a number of years now. You were in 15 or 16 when you actually composed the first songs for Liza Minnelli right. as a gift for her mother, right. an audition of sorts. Right. That was momentous in your life. That was one of the most, most momentous uh, nights of my life because a, a friend of mine was dating Liza Minnelli. Mm -hmm. I got to know Liza through my friend. You know, we both went to the same school. And we decided for Christmas to do a thing where we would go into a studio and we would record three or four songs with Liza and then present it to her mother, Judy Garland, at Christmas.